uh, of the season of Lent. You have the, the order of service in front of you. It's, it's a, a brief one, as has been our custom the last few years. Uh, and uh, everything is printed out for you. And just a reminder, uh, as per our revised protocol, uh, we will be uh, singing the last verse, those two stanzas of the, of the last hymn, rather. Uh, so just that reminder. The classic uh, Lenten hymn, which we're not singing today, uh, but often is, is sung at either the first uh, Wednesday or the first Sunday of Lent, at least it used to be, uh, Jesus, I will ponder now, huh? Jesus, I will ponder now on your holy passion. With your spirit, me and now, for such meditation. Grant that I, in love and faith, may the image cherish of your suffering, pain, and death, that I may not perish. Uh, in the spirit of that hymn, we begin uh, our worship today. Uh, the opening hymn uh, to be sung uh, for us is actually hymn 339, verses 1 and 2. In case those who are going to be watching this are singing along at home, uh, 339, verses 1 and 2, today, your mercy calls us. <clears throat>
If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Upon this, your confession, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Amen. And we pray. Lord God, we thank you for this day of grace now drawing to a close. Stay with us and warm our hearts with your forgiving love in Christ. May your word keep our faith burning brightly, that we may walk in the light of your presence through the darkness of this world. Come and bless us as we worship you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. On this Ash Wednesday, we read the appointed scripture lessons uh, for the day. Uh, rather than beginning the reading of the Passion History, which we will begin uh, next Wednesday and read that in uh, five portions in, instead of six. So we read, first of all, the Old Testament reading for today from the prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 59, verses 12 through 20. And as we have seen and heard so very often, uh, Isaiah, the Holy Spirit through Isaiah, loves the picture language of prophecy. And here the picture language speaks clearly of repentance, that is confession of sin, and faith in forgiveness. The prophet writes, Yes, our rebellious deeds are many before you, and our sins testify against us. Our rebellious deeds are with us, and as for our guilty deeds, we are aware of them. Those deeds are rebellion and treachery against the Lord. We turn back from following our God. We incite oppression and apostasy, falling away. We conceive and mutter deceitful words from our hearts. Justice is turned back, and righteousness stands far away. For truth stumbles in the city square, and honesty cannot enter it. The truth is missing, and anyone who turns from evil makes himself pray. The Lord looked and saw something evil. There was no justice. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one who could intervene. So his own arm worked salvation for him, and his own righteousness supported him. He clothed himself with righteousness like armor and wore a helmet of salvation on his head. He dressed in garments for vengeance, and he wrapped himself with zeal like a cloak. He will repay in full what they have earned, namely, wrath to his foes, and full payment to his enemies. He will repay even the distant coastlands. From the west they will fear the Lord's name, and from the rising of the sun they will fear his glory. For he will come like a raging river driven by the Spirit of the Lord. Then a Redeemer will come for Zion, and for those in Jacob who turn from rebellion, this is the declaration of the Lord. We also read the uh, epistle reading for Ash Wednesday, Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, the last part of uh, verse 20 in chapter 5, reading through the second verse of chapter 6. It's got to be one of the most beautiful gospels uh, in the New Testament, uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And you can never go wrong if you don't know what to do for a private devotion. Just pull out 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and, and you'll be glad you did. 
a beautiful passage of the good news and forgiveness uh, in Christ. Therefore, Paul says, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making his appeal through us. We urge you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who did not know sin to become sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. As fellow workers, we also urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, At a favorable time I listened to you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. Look, now is the favorable time. See, now is the day of salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Our uh, next uh, song for today, In Hopelessness and Near Despair.
If my sins give me alarm and my conscience grieve me, let your cross my fear disarm. Peace of conscience give me. Help me see forgiveness won by your holy passion. If for me he slays his son, God must have compassion. Another verse from that hymn, which helps put this season of Lent in perspective uh, for us. The word of God for us today is the gospel lesson appointed for Ash Wednesday. It's from, as you can see in the bottom of page 3, from Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. The parable, and I think probably to most, the familiar parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And the message of the hands of repentance. Jesus told this parable to certain people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and looked down on others. Two men went up to the temple courts to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed about himself like this. God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. However, the tax collector stood at a distance and would not even lift his eyes up to heaven, but was beating his chest and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went home justified rather than the other, because everyone who exalts himself will be humble, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. This is God's word. How many times do you think in your life have you observed Lent? A few? <laughs> Maybe a whole lot. The story doesn't change a whole lot, does it? Every year, the same Palm Sunday donkey ride into Jerusalem the same Monday into Thursday of preaching and teaching and reaching the upper room, the garden, Gethsemane, the courtyard, the courtrooms, and then, of course, to Calvary's holy mountain, the cross. But saying that, think of all the, the, the different ways the church has, has packaged Lent over the years. All the different themes. All the different ways that, that God gives to his church so that we can tell that old, old story of Jesus and his love. 2021 is no exception. Just when I heard, I thought I heard it all, then there's this. The hands. The hands of the passion. Hands so necessary, so indispensable for us in our lives, right? But at the same time, so easy to take for granted. Hands. Hands play a role in the passion of our Savior, too. His passion, that is, his suffering and his death. We begin today not with one of the so-called major characters of the story, but two guys from a parable of Jesus, the Pharisee, the tax collector. As we remember them as we recall the prayers that they prayed 
Let's try to picture their hands. Let's try to make a connection between the actions of their hands and, and the attitudes of their hearts. And let's not forget all of this. It's not just about them. It's about you. So there and then, here and now, we're going to talk about hands. And today, hands of repentance. There's a basic Lenten theme for you. Repentance, Lent, the season of repentance. Here's the parable. To some who were confident of their own righteousness, people who looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. So, Simple enough. Two men go to church. Oh, there were other people around there too, no doubt, but, but we focus on these two guys. Two fictional, right? But yet very two very believable people. And they both have come to this sacred place for the same purpose, to pray. And they both begin their prayer with the same word. God. But that's where the similarities stop. Now, the Pharisee you'd expect to see at the temple regularly. He's probably very well dressed, all business, looks like a leader, a religious professional from head to toe. The Pharisees, as you probably remember, were the, the spiritual elite among the Jews. They were always quick to be the ones to take the moral high ground. These Pharisees often then appeared to be, well, maybe just a cut above. A bit more reverent a bit more obedient than all their fellow Jews. And apparently this Pharisee was strategically and probably intentionally positioned in such a way that everyone would be able to see and hear him. He prayed, God, I thank you. God, I thank you. <laughs> Not a bad way to start, huh? If only he had stopped there. God, I thank you, amen. Would have been good. But he didn't stop. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. Let's look for the hands. Because even if they were folded devoutly in prayer, even if they were wonderfully held up in a reverent looking prayer posture, it sounds like his hands were a little more busy patting himself on the back. He's convinced that he not only kept the law, but he's what above and beyond. He doesn't really ask God for anything here because I guess he pretty much has everything he needs. Lucky God, huh? He wasn't a robber. He was a big giver. He wasn't a glutton. He, he was a disciplined faster twice a week. He was a spiritual cut above everyone else. All you had to do probably was ask him. And he'd probably tell you. This Pharisee was doing just fine, thank you very much. Why turn to God? Why turn to Him in repentance when you've got yourself? Well, probably should say this. Luke, Luke does not give us the details. and God does not tell us 
what this man's actual motives may have been, what was really in his heart. So, so maybe we got to be just a little careful when we think about him and, and talk about him. Was he really so full of himself that he could be so arrogant? Maybe all of this proud praying was covering up his own insecurities. Were all these alleged good things that he was reciting, were they just a cover-up for all the bad things that he had done? Or, or maybe even other good things that he didn't do? Maybe he wasn't really trying to convince anybody else of anything. Maybe the person he was trying to convince was, was himself. Either way, Ash Wednesday is about acknowledging sin. Ash Wednesday is about seeking God's forgiveness. It's about pleading with Him for that forgiveness. Ash Wednesday is about looking to Jesus as the only source of forgiveness and peace and hope for life and for forever. A Pharisee? Anybody who can't or, or won't see their need to be saved. When there is no repentance, it doesn't really matter how many prayers are being offered or how many deeds are, are being done. Look at the hands. This man, we're told, went home with empty hands. But there's, there's the other guy, right? The one in the back, in the corner. Nobody hardly even notices him. And you know what? He's okay with that. The tax collector. Very likely a, a tax thief. A cheat. Probably no one ever accused him of being a saint. He's obviously troubled. He's not a man who's full of himself, but a guy who looks like he's running on empty. He's not praying to be praised, but praying to be forgiven. Not a man who was bragging, but a man who truly was repenting. A man who was turning, not to himself, but to his God. Look at his hands. Maybe even clenched in a fist, beating his breast in shame and uncertainty. He knew the score. He knew what he had done and he understood what he deserved. The tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Short and simple. God, have mercy on me. Literally, his prayer says, God, be appeased. You see, he knew that there was nothing that he could be, nothing that he could do, that would make him right in God's sight. He doesn't get into all the comparisons with, with all those really, really bad people. Forget about me. No back-slapping resume enumerating all the wonderful things that he had done. He knew the score. He knew he wasn't the answer. He knew that God himself would have to appease his, God's wrath towards sin. And Ash Wednesday reminds us that God did exactly that. Jesus wasn't talking to just Pharisees or tax collectors and not even his disciples. Of course, we, we all know that, that he, he's talking to us, and specifically it says here, to those who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else. 
Know anybody fits that description? <laughs> I would imagine with a little effort we could all think of someone. Huh? But then as they always say, what do you see when you look in the mirror? Hey, I, I maybe don't fast twice a week. In fact, fasting's not really my thing. But yet, I wasn't slamming down cheap beers or uh, tossing even cheaper beads or reveling in all the excesses of, of a fat Tuesday. No, I, I, I don't and I can't really give a tenth of all that I have, but I did bring my envelope. Yeah. Do you know anybody who fits the description? God, I, I know that I'm saved by grace, but, but certainly you know that I'm doing my best, and that has to be worth something, huh? That's got to be good enough. Ash Wednesday, again, means trading in our, our comfortable security blankets of any type of, of self-righteousness, whatever shape, form, or degree it might be, and to trade that in for the sackcloth and ashes of true and genuine contrition and repentance. God is not comparing you and me to anybody else. Isn't God always comparing us to his holy, sinless self? In mercy, God rips away that, that self-righteousness. All those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. You see, Ash Wednesday also commemorates something. It commemorates the fact that God has appeased himself through the suffering and death of his son. The prophet Isaiah nailed it when he said, He, the Lord, saw that there was no one. There was no one to intervene. So his own arm achieved salvation and his own righteousness sustained him. Ash Wednesday is always the eternal yearly answer to the tax collector's prayer. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. Really? That guy? Why would God do that? How can God do that? Well, we know how, right? And we know why. The Lord of heaven became the criminal on the cross. The God who fills the universe filled a cold, dark tomb. The Lord of glory became the suffering servant. And why? so that all of God's wrath against sin would be appeased for once and for all. Not by ignoring sin, but by dealing with it. By punishing it in His Son. Jesus became the chief of sinners so that we, the chiefs of sinners, can become His sons and daughters. Take one more look at the parable and the two men. You see the third guy in the parable? Yeah, the Savior who told the story. Look at his hands. You can't see it now, but they will be nail pierced, stretched out on the cross. And then hands held out in blessing and promise. Because of his mercy, Jesus took our place. He lived our sinful, our sinless lives. 
He died our death on the cross, and he did our time in hell. All for our benefit. It's in mercy that he sits at the right hand of God. And there he intercedes for you and for me. And there he stands up for us before our Heavenly Father. And again, he does all of that for us. In mercy, he gives us our worship and our prayers. And he promises and tells us that we can talk to him anytime about anything. And he promises that he's always going to hear and he's always going to answer us and always it's going to be for what's best. Because of God's mercy, you and I don't have to be, be weighed down by, by guilt and shame and, and fear and, and doubts and, and uncertainty. Because of His mercy, you have nothing to fear. Because you know that your Savior is, is with you as long as you live. <laughs> and now you also know where you're going when you die. Folks, in mercy, we get to leave here today and we get to go on living perhaps tomorrow with a humble but a certain confidence, knowing that we're in good hands because we're in God's hands. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll continue our worship with our uh, prayers and then the evening prayer. Uh, just take me a moment to, to get to the altar. We pray. Holy and righteous God, as we begin again this spiritual journey of Lent, we come to you in humility and repentance. We confess that we are sinners, both by nature, which we inherit, but also by our own sinful thoughts and desires, our, our words and our actions. And because of our sins, we deserve your wrath and punishment. Yet, you reveal yourself, not only as a God of holiness and justice, but a God of mercy and a God of love. We can only despair of our own merit and worthiness. But yet, in response to your invitation of grace, we come to you certain of your forgiveness. You have revealed your love and your mercy for us and for all sinners in Jesus, the Christ, your Son, our Savior. You sent him into our world to be that atoning sacrifice for the sins of all. Help us to, to grasp by faith that great truth that, that the pain and suffering, the mockery, the ridicule, the, the death and punishment he endured should have been ours. Help us to understand that in incom incomprehensible love, he suffered and he died for us. God of grace and mercy, may your Holy Spirit continue to be with us as we follow the road of the cross. As we contemplate the story of our Savior's passion, build us up, build us up in our faith, Renew in us the, the zeal to serve you by being a reflector of your love in our lives. Give us the desire and the ability to boldly proclaim the grace in which we now stand, 
so that all for whom you lived and died may join us in fellowship here and now and in your presence forever. We offer our humble thanks and praise, our, our prayers and all our petitions. We offer ourselves in body and spirit to you, Lord God. Hear us according to your promise and for Jesus' sake. Amen. I might now invite the congregation to, to please stand and, and join me in the evening prayer, and then we will continue with the Lord's blessing. Together, all praise to you, our God, this night for all the blessings of the light. Keep us, yes, keep us, King of Kings, beneath your own almighty wings. Forgive us, Lord, through your dear Son, for sins that we this day have done, that as we sleep, peace we would hold with all, with you within our souls. Amen. Receive now this blessing of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son be with us in truth and love. Amen. Amen. We'll have you remain standing as we join in singing the, uh, the closing hymn verses. Maybe just a quick uh, announcement before we do that. Uh, the service folders you can take home with you. We are going to be having different ones uh, next week. The opening part of the service basically stays the same. Of course, the hymns and all the readings uh, of the theme uh, will change uh, each week. So, Chief of Zinner, Sinners, Though I Be. Thank you. Thank you for worshiping and uh, have a great rest of the week.